Hello my friends and welcome back to the You Can Do TV channel. Broadcast in situ piling. A deep foundation technique in the world of construction and civil engineering, the importance of a sturdy and reliable foundation cannot be overstated. Deep foundations, which provide structural support for high-rise buildings, bridges and other structures, are essential when the soil conditions at a construction site cannot bear the loads imposed by the structure. One of the most widely used methods for creating deep foundations is broadcast in situ piling, a versatile and effective technique. In this video, we will delve into the key aspects of broadcast in situ piling, including drilling, identification of hole points, underwater concreting, and head cutting piles. Drilling. The foundation of any construction project begins with drilling. In the context of broadcast in situ piling, this step is pivotal as it involves creating holes deep into the earth to facilitate the installation of piles. These holes are typically drilled with the use of heavy machinery, such as rotary drilling rigs or augers. The depth and diameter of the holes depend on the specific requirements of the project, as well as the load-bearing capacity of the soil. One of the advantages of broadcast in situ piling is its adaptability to various soil types. Whether the site features cohesive soils like clay or granular soils like sand and gravel, this method is capable of creating a solid foundation. By drilling through different soil layers, broadcast in situ piling allows for the customization of pile lengths and the selection of appropriate pile types based on the soil's characteristics. Identification of hole points. Precise and accurate identification of hole points is essential for the success of the broadcast in situ piling technique. This step involves the careful selection of the locations where piles will be installed. Factors like the building's load distribution, site conditions, and soil composition play a critical role in determining the optimal positions for pile placement. Geotechnical studies and site investigations are conducted to evaluate the soil properties and its bearing capacity. These studies help engineers identify the most suitable locations for drilling the piles. Moreover, the shape and arrangement of piles are crucial considerations. Depending on the project requirements, piles can be installed in a grid pattern or strategically placed to support specific load points. Underwater concreting Broadcast in situ piling is often employed in scenarios where water is present, such as coastal areas or regions with high groundwater levels. In these cases, underwater concreting becomes an essential part of the technique. After the holes are drilled, they may need to be partially or completely submerged in water. To create a robust foundation in such conditions, the piles are cast in situ using underwater concreting. The process involves lowering a steel cage or reinforcement into the drilled hole. This cage provides structural integrity to the pile, which is then filled with concrete. To ensure the concrete is properly placed and adheres to quality standards, various techniques, such as tremi pipes or bottom dumping, are used. These methods help prevent the segregation of materials and maintain the integrity of the concrete in the underwater environment. Head cutting piles. Once the piles are installed and the concrete has set, the next crucial step in broadcast in situ piling is head cutting. This process involves leveling the pile heads to the desired elevation, which ensures that the piles will support the structure effectively. Depending on the project's requirements, this can be done using various cutting and leveling techniques, including saw cutting, hydro demolition, or blasting. In head cutting, it is essential to achieve precise elevation and alignment to guarantee the integrity and stability of the foundation. The accuracy of this step is crucial for high-rise buildings and other structures where even minor discrepancies can have significant consequences on the entire construction. The construction process of diaphragm walls is a complex and precise operation used to create retaining walls for deep excavations. These walls are designed to be sturdy, watertight, 
and capable of withstanding the lateral earth pressures exerted by the surrounding soil. Here's a step-by-step -step overview of the construction process for diaphragm walls. Trench preparation. The first step involves excavating a trench along the planned wall alignment. The dimensions of the trench are determined by the design specifications, which are typically prepared by geotechnical engineers. The trench is usually wider than the final width of the diaphragm wall to allow space for workers and equipment. Cutting. Specialized equipment is used to cut the trench to the required depth. Typically, heavy-duty cranes with suspended cutters are employed. The choice of cutter and crane depends on the project's size and specific requirements. Common cutters include Bauer BC-32 and BC-40 units. Bentonite desanding. Bentonite slurry is often used to support the trench walls and stabilize the excavation. Bentonite is a type of clay that, when mixed with water, forms a highly viscous and stable slurry. It helps prevent the trench from collapsing and acts as a lubricant during cutter penetration. Bentonite testing. The properties of the bentonite slurry, such as its viscosity and density, need to be monitored and adjusted as necessary to ensure that it maintains its stability and effectiveness in supporting the trench walls. Cutter removal. After the trench is cut to the required depth, the cutters are removed. The trench is now ready for the installation of reinforcement cages and the subsequent concrete pour. Cage installation. Reinforcement cages, which are typically made of steel bars, are lowered into the trench. These cages provide structural integrity to the diaphragm wall, especially in terms of tensile strength. The cage design and placement are determined by the project's engineering specifications. Concrete testing. Prior to the concrete pour, the quality of the concrete mix is tested to ensure that it meets the required standards. This includes assessing factors like the mix's strength, workability, and durability. Concreting. Once the trench is prepared, the reinforcement cages are in place and the concrete mix is verified, the final step is to pour the concrete into the trench. Concrete is often placed using tremi pipes, a technique that involves continuously filling the trench from the bottom up to minimize the risk of segregation or contamination. Constructing the diaphragm wall at the ITC Hotel Project in Gale Face, Sri Lanka. The construction of the diaphragm wall at the ITC Hotel Project in Gale Face, Sri Lanka, is a remarkable feat of modern engineering. The diaphragm wall, a critical element in the foundation of the luxurious hotel complex. Excavation and grab bucket technology. Once the planning was complete, the actual construction process commenced with excavation. 
Access Engineering PLC introduced the innovative Magnificent Power GB34 grab bucket for the excavation process. This advanced technology allowed for precise and vertical trench digging, crucial for the success of the diaphragm wall. The Magnificent Power GB34 grab bucket, equipped with onboard computers, maintained tension and minimized lateral oscillation, ensuring the stability and accuracy of the trench walls. This level of precision was critical in creating a robust foundation for the hotel complex. Environmental considerations. The contractor used a slurry of bentonite, a natural clay material, during excavation. The bentonite slurry served multiple purposes, including preventing side caving during trench construction and reducing the environmental impact of the project. The use of bentonite slurry not only contributed to the project's environmental sustainability but also promoted cost savings. Furthermore, it aligned with the project's objective of reusing materials wherever possible, reducing waste and minimizing the ecological footprint. Quality control and rebar cage installation. To ensure the structural integrity of the diaphragm wall, the contractor employed rigorous quality control measures. Rather than relying on traditional spot welding or tying, they opted for on-site prefabrication of rebar cages. This approach enhanced workability and reduced construction costs. The use of couplers for rebar connections further streamlined the construction process. These couplers provided a reliable and efficient method for joining reinforcement bars, contributing to the strength and durability of the diaphragm wall. Concrete placement and slurry management. The construction process involved the precise placement of concrete using the double tremi technique. The use of self-compacted concrete ensured an efficient filling of the trench, while the simultaneous management of the slurry was critical to maintain the diaphragm wall's integrity. As concrete was introduced into the trench, the slurry was pushed upward to the surface. This process not only prevented the collapse of the trench walls but also contributed to the overall efficiency of the construction. Soil anchoring for stability. Soil anchoring was a fundamental aspect of the diaphragm wall construction process, particularly in a coastal area prone to high water tables and potential soil instability. The contractor employed the Eclair machine, a technologically advanced device capable of anchoring the diaphragm wall with the surrounding subterranean soil. The soil anchoring process involved the installation of slender elements, known as nails, into rows of holes bored into the soil. High-pressure grouting secured these nails, enhancing the stability and verticality of the diaphragm wall. Wedge plates further provided stability, ensuring the long-term structural integrity of the wall. The Eurasia Undersea Tunnel Project, also known as the Istanbul Straight Road Tube Crossing Project, is a remarkable engineering achievement that connects the European and Asian sides of Istanbul through a 14.6-kilometer-long highway tunnel that runs beneath the Bosphorus Strait. This project is a testament to Turkey's commitment to developing modern infrastructure to support its growing economy and population. In this section, we will delve into the construction process of this impressive project. The project is divided into three main sections, with the first and third sections located on the European and Anatolian sides of Istanbul, respectively. However, the most critical and iconic section of the project is the straight crossing a 5.4-kilometer-long tunnel consisting of two decks, each with two lanes. The tunnel is designed exclusively for use by light vehicles and features automatic toll gates and a main control building to manage operations.
Construction of the tunnel was a complex process that required the use of state-of-the-art technology and innovative engineering techniques. To bore the tunnel, a tunnel boring machine, TBM, produced in Germany by the renowned company Herenicht was employed. This TBM, known as the TBM Earth Pressure Balance Shield, EPB, was specially designed to withstand the high water pressure of the Bosphorus Strait. It boasts a massive 13.7-meter diameter, making it the sixth-largest TBM in the world. The geological challenges of the project were immense, as the TBM had to advance through 810 meters of varying geological strata, including rock formations and soft sea sediments. The different soil conditions required the TBM to be equipped with a multi-disc cutter head capable of handling various types of soil. This cutter head consists of numerous small tools that can be easily replaced if they become damaged during the excavation process. An innovative conveyor system was also employed to transport the excavated material from the tunnel's face to the surface, where it was removed by trucks. This system minimized the amount of material that needed to be transported through the tunnel and reduced the risk of congestion. The tunnel was designed with a primary focus on safety and structural integrity. It is built to withstand earthquakes of up to magnitude 7.5 on the Richter scale, which is considered a major earthquake. The structural design includes reinforced concrete walls that are 80 centimeters thick, steel supports, and waterproofing measures to prevent water leakage. In addition, the tunnel features an emergency ventilation system that can provide fresh air in the event of a fire or other emergency ensuring the safety of commuters and travelers. The safety features of the tunnel are equally impressive. It is equipped with an advanced fire detection and suppression system, an automatic incident detection system, and a video surveillance system. This video surveillance system consists of 550 cameras strategically placed throughout the tunnel, providing real-time footage to the control center, allowing for swift responses in case of emergencies or incidents. The tunnel's tolling system is based on a dynamic pricing model, with toll fees varying based on the time of day and traffic volume. Higher fees are charged during peak hours to encourage drivers to travel during off-peak times. Payment of toll fees can be made using electronic payment systems such as RFID tags or credit cards. With a maximum gradient of 5%, the tunnel allows vehicles to travel at a maximum speed of 80 km per hour. It has a remarkable capacity of accommodating up to 100,000 vehicles per day, which will significantly reduce travel times between the European and Asian sides of Istanbul during rush hours. The arduous commute between Gaztepe and Kuzguncik, which could take more than 100 minutes, will be reduced to just 15 minutes thanks to the Eurasia Tunnel. The Expressway Route 1 Expressway Daishi Bridge Renewal Project is a significant infrastructure endeavor aimed at upgrading and renewing a vital transport link that connects Tokyo and Kanagawa Prefecture. This project focuses on the Daishi Bridge, which is a crucial part of Expressway Route 1. The project began with the preparation of the bridge girders at the Hanu no Makoji Foundation Construction Yard in Tokyo. These girders were assembled into large blocks for transportation. To accomplish this, a giant watercraft known as the Mount Dazen was employed, making multiple trips to move the girders across the Tama River.
The central span of the bridge, referred to as the synonym Heim 6 block, was a vital component of the project. It was assembled at the Nigumi Yard in Yokohama and featured impressive dimensions with a length of 132 meters and a weight of approximately 1,900 tons. The assembly work for the new bridge involved various parts that were installed, including fishing capacity and crane installations. The girders were transported from the Yokohama Yard to the Tama River, and meticulous planning was required to ensure the safety of this operation. As the girders passed under the Tamagawa Sky Bridge, spacer barges were used to prevent contact with the bridge piers. The project also involved careful timing to navigate under the Tamagawa Sky Bridge during the low shade of the pine tree to avoid any contact. The girders were transported upstream of the Tama River, eventually reaching the construction site of the new expressway bridge. The entire process was executed with precision and coordination, involving the use of powerful equipment and the collaboration of skilled professionals. This renewal project was a massive undertaking, and it aimed to ensure the safety and efficiency of the Expressway Route 1 for years to come. As of 2023, the project is nearing its completion, with the new bridge expected to be operational soon. It represents a vital part of the region's infrastructure and serves as a testament to the dedication and expertise of the construction teams involved in its renewal. The Daishi Bridge Renewal Project will contribute to the continued connectivity and transportation between Tokyo and Kanagawa Prefecture for the foreseeable future. The construction process of the Nguyen Camp Rhine Bridge was a complex and impressive engineering endeavor aimed at improving transport infrastructure in the rotterdam duisburg corridor, a crucial route for trade and connectivity between the Lower Rhine and the Ruhr area. This new bridge was needed due to the limitations of the existing bridge, which could no longer handle the growing traffic and increasing loads. Site Preparation The first step involved establishing the construction roads, pre-assembly site, and other necessary facilities like offices to support the project. These preparations were essential for the smooth execution of the construction process. Foundation Construction The foundation work included the construction of bridge pillars and auxiliary pillars. These pillars are the support structures for the bridge, and they needed to be constructed before the main bridge superstructure. Superstructure Construction The bridge superstructure was divided into two parts the northern and southern sections. The northern superstructure was built first. The southern bridge was constructed separately, and once ready, it was moved 14.4 meters across to its final position. Steel fabrication. The bridge's superstructure was made from 297 large components and thousands of smaller parts, with a total weight of 13,600 tons of steel. These steel components were manufactured in various European plants to ensure precise fitting. Assembly. Ensuring the accuracy of fit for all components was critical. A detailed survey concept with precise measurement points and tolerances was established. Almost 350 heavy goods transports were used to deliver these components to the construction site in Duisburg. On site, the steel components were welded together to form the bridge structure. Construction methods. Two main construction methods were employed pushing and cantilever construction. The pushing method involved extending the bridge outward using gantry cranes and adding sections to the existing bridge structure. The cantilever construction method involved the assembly of 30-meter-long bridge parts in a controlled manner.
Sustainability. Throughout the construction, sustainability was a key focus. Measures were taken to save building materials, reduce waste, and minimize CO2 emissions. This approach aimed to mitigate the environmental impact of the project. Pylon construction. Four pylons were built for the bridge, each consisting of 48 components and reaching a height of 70 meters. These pylons added aesthetic and structural elements to the bridge. Bridge wedding. In March 2023, a significant milestone was reached when the final bridge component was placed, closing the gap between the bridge sections. This event is known as the bridge wedding, signifying a major step towards the completion of the bridge. Once the bridge wedding was celebrated, there was still work to be done, including the installation of railings, noise barriers, and the asphalt superstructure. The completion of this impressive project would result in an expanded A40 with eight lanes and a new bridge with significant dimensions, including a height of 70 meters, a length of 812 meters, and a width of 68.25 meters. The new Camp Rhine Bridge would play a vital role in enhancing transportation between Rotterdam and Duisburg and accommodating the growing traffic in the region. The Obervermont Work II hydroelectric power plant project is a colossal infrastructure endeavor situated in the Austrian Alps. It entails the construction of a high-pressure head race tunnel that will link the existing Obervermont Work I power plant to a new underground power station. Stretching approximately 11 kilometers in length, this tunnel will be used to channel water from the Silveretta mountain range to the power plant. This article provides a comprehensive overview of the tunnel construction process for this ambitious project. The initial stage in the tunnel construction process is meticulous planning and design. This encompasses a thorough survey of the project site, mapping out the proposed tunnel route, and the creation of a detailed tunnel layout. The project team utilizes computer-aided design software to generate 3D models of the tunnel, allowing them to assess the project's feasibility. Additionally, the design phase involves determining the tunneling method to be employed. For the Obervermont Work II project, the tunnel is being constructed using the drill and blast method. This method necessitates the use of explosives to create an opening in the rock, which is subsequently excavated using appropriate equipment. The following phase in the tunnel construction process is site preparation. This involves getting the construction site ready and establishing the necessary infrastructure for the project. Key activities in this phase encompass building access roads, setting up a base camp for workers, and installing the required machinery and equipment. Extensive geological surveys are also carried out during this stage to identify the type of rock that will be encountered during excavation. This crucial information is used to select the most suitable excavation method and design an effective tunnel support system. Excavation constitutes the most time-consuming phase of the tunnel construction process. It entails drilling into the rock and removing the excavated material through a combination of drilling, blasting, and excavation equipment. In the case of the Obervermont Work II project, a tunnel boring machine, TBM, is employed for excavation. This massive machine features a large cylindrical cutting head that rotates while cutting through the rock. The excavated material is then transported out of the tunnel using a conveyor system. The excavation phase posed numerous challenges for the project team, and they encountered setbacks along the way. One significant setback occurred in the spring of 2015 when a massive water infiltration event took place in the Schinbrader Tunnel. This infiltration, caused by up to 120 liters of water per second flowing from the rock, proved to be a formidable challenge. However, the team managed to redirect the water using specialized equipment and their expertise. 
One of the remarkable aspects of the project was the construction of the massive machine cavern. This cavern, designed to be 125 meters long, 35 meters high, and 25 meters wide, was excavated from the top to the bottom of the mountain using up to 800 kilograms of explosives for each blast, removing as much as 1,500 cubic meters of rock. Another notable feature of the Obervermentwerk II hydroelectric power plant project was the vertical water lock. This component was designed to balance the pressure of the water when switching between turbine and pump operation. The lock required a 1,280-meter deep hole to be drilled by an Italian specialist firm to reach the Shin Ritter Tunnel. A 3-meter diameter drill head was then installed and used to cut through 280 meters of rock from the bottom to the top of the lock. This process took three weeks to complete, with the drill head finally emerging from the top of the lock in March 2015. The project's success hinges significantly on the quality of rebar fabrication and concrete work. This section delves into the details of the rebar fabrication and concrete process. Concrete is the primary building material used in the Obervermentwerk II project, with a total requirement of 270,000 cubic meters to complete the construction. Concrete is utilized to form various structural elements of the power plant, including walls, columns, and foundations. The concrete process involves several stages, commencing with the mixing of raw materials. Raw materials for the project consist of cement, aggregates, water, and admixtures. The concrete mix used in the project boasts a design strength of C50 to 60, meaning it can withstand a compressive strength of 50 MPa after 28 days of curing. Mixing is conducted using a concrete batching plant located on site, boasting a production capacity of 150 cubic meters per hour and equipped with multiple mixers for continuous production. The plant features a computerized control system to monitor and regulate the mixing process for consistent quality. Once the concrete is mixed, it is transported to the construction site using a fleet of trucks. A company named Wholesome is responsible for producing the concrete used in the construction of the power plant. Wholesome is a prominent supplier of cement, aggregates, and ready-mix concrete, operating a network of facilities worldwide. Rebar fabrication is a crucial component of the project, providing the necessary reinforcement for the concrete structure. The rebar fabrication process involves multiple stages, starting with the preparation of raw materials. Raw steel bars are cut to the required length using cutting machines, totaling 7,400,000 meters in length for the project. After cutting, the bars undergo straightening to ensure they are free from deformities or bends. Following straightening, the rebar undergoes a bending process using an automated bending machine. This machine utilizes a computer-rated design, CAD, program to shape the bars to the required curvature and form. The project utilized a total of 23,700 tons of rebar with diameters ranging from 12 mm to 40 mm. After the bending process, quality control checks are conducted to ensure that the bars meet the project's specifications. These checks encompass visual inspections, dimension measurements, and tensile testing to verify the bar's strength. The concrete pouring process involves several stages. Once the formwork is prepared, it is inspected and cleaned to ensure it is free from debris. Any necessary repairs are made at this point, and a release agent is applied to the formwork to prevent the concrete from sticking.
The concrete is mixed according to the specified mix design, which calls for high-strength concrete with a compressive strength of 55 megapascals. The mix consists of cement, sand, aggregates, and water with a water-cement ratio of 0.35. The mixing process is continuously monitored to ensure it meets the required specifications. The concrete is then transported to the pour location using a concrete pump. As the concrete is poured, rebar is carefully placed and secured in the correct position using a rebar placer. The rebar is spaced and tied according to the specified details to provide the required strength and durability to the structure. Regular inspections are conducted to ensure the proper placement and security of the rebar. After pouring, the concrete undergoes a curing process, which involves maintaining a constant temperature and moisture level for 28 days to achieve the required strength. The steel armor manufacturing process is also a crucial part of the project, primarily concerning the pressure shaft. These steel armors are produced by Bilfinger Formenbau in Wells, Upper Austria. Thick metal sheets are rolled and bent into pipes with a diameter of 4.5 meters, which are then welded together in the assembly hall at the base of the dam. The pipes are transported to the upper end of the pressure shaft using specialized vehicles and lowered into the shaft at a steep angle of 48 degrees. The entire system, including a rescue boat, weighs 70 tons. Afterward, the pipes are transported to Switzerland and lowered into the tunnel with a winch boasting a capacity of 60 tons. In total, eight pipes are welded together to create a stable armor at the bottom of the pressure shaft. The distribution pipeline starts with a hose pipe, dividing the water into the two turbines. The walls of this pipeline are several centimeters thick, and the individual parts are welded together. In Wells, Upper Austria, large pumps are manufactured with spirals approximately 9 meters in diameter and weighing 100 tons each. Individual sheet metal parts are bent and welded together to form the spiral. The pumps are transported to the site in parts and assembled with the assistance of a cavern crane. 